Our guest in this segment is Fred Albert. He is the president of the American Federation of Teachers, West Virginia. Good morning, Fred. How are you, sir? Good morning, Rob. I am well. Good morning, Matt, and good morning, Bill. And I guess it's not too late to wish you Happy New Year. Well, thank you, Fred. Happy New Year as well. Yeah. Thank you. Are you uh, uh, hunkering in somewhere nice and warm this morning? Actually, I am standing in the lobby of the Holiday Inn in South Charleston, West Virginia. I'm here uh, working with the West Virginia Department of Education on a policy review called Expected uh, Behavior and Supportive Schools, Policy 4373. So I am splitting up my time today between this and going to our capital to the legislature but i am staying warm to answer your question yes very nice tell, tell us about this policy does this uh, deal with discipline and behavior in schools fred it does it's a policy that's already in place uh, this is just you know every so often policies have to be reviewed updated revised uh antiquated language has to be taken out and new language put in so that's what we're spending the day today and tomorrow i'm part of a group called external stakeholders um dale lee from wvea is also here today and we have educators we have community members uh service personnel so we are all working on this together today and again tomorrow obviously it's a serious issue if it has uh, come up to this point where you need to review the policy uh, Fred, is this a top priority? It is. It's a very serious issue because what we're hearing from our educators across the state, we heard this last year, if you remember, you know, we came to your area of the state. We traveled, uh, Dale Lee and myself, we traveled all over the state listening to educators and parents and service personnel and students about the issues that matter most to them. And one of the overwhelming issues uh, is student discipline. Um, we are finding that um, even in earlier grades, and I'm talking pre-K through fifth grade in elementary school, we're seeing behaviors that we have not seen before, distracting behaviors. And we need to get a handle on this because we're hearing from our educators that they don't feel supported in what they're doing. Um, they need help because we all know that you can't teach and you can't learn in a classroom that's disruptive. And while I do want to say many, 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 many of our students come to school, they do the right thing, they follow instructions, they behave themselves, but it only takes one or two to upset the whole, what my grandmother used to say, upset the whole apple cart. And um, then you have a problem and if you don't have support and you don't have a way to handle that problem, you've, you've got a bigger issue. How big of an issue is uh, students uh, attacking teachers or bus drivers or cafeteria workers, staff in any form uh, in our schools in West Virginia, Fred? That is. Uh, you know, it's happening. And we're having teachers report and, and classroom aides report that they've been physically hurt, uh, broken fingers. Um, uh, concussions, um, multiple attacks like that. And that that's traumatic to the other students in the classroom. When they witness uh, that type of behavior, it, it affects them as well. So we need to do something. Uh, we need to find out why these students are behaving the way they're behaving or misbehaving the way they're misbehaving. Why, why, what's causing that? And how can we help them uh, change their behavior. What is the policy right now in the state in regards to a student attacking a teacher and the teacher's rights and ability to defend uh, him or herself and, in fact, well, the support that they are given then by the school in the aftermath of an attack? That, that's, that's a very good question. I appreciate you asking that. It's not allowed. You're not allowed to, you know, attack a teacher or a school employee, a cook, a custodian, bus driver. Uh, there are consequences, but here's the issue. In many cases, the law is not being followed uh, as it is written, and we have to find out why it's not being followed. Is it, you know, we have a shortage. We have a shortage of teachers, service personnel, administrators all across the board. And people are working extremely hard 
long days trying to do the best that they can do. But for some reason, some of these uh, consequences are not being – we're not holding those up. We're not doing what we need to do to take care of the issue. We're not promoting or saying that students necessarily need to be suspended, but they need to be helped. We need to give them the help that they need to overcome whatever it is that's causing them to act out in class. And, and many of our students – well, I don't want to say many – but some of our students are coming from um, real tra trauma, uh, whether it's in the home or in the community. Uh, they're suffering from some pretty traumatic situations. Bill? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Fred. Uh, good morning, norm Bill. Normally we ask, what bills are you pushing, trying to get through? I'm going to do a kind of a flip question. Wh are there some bills working their way through the system that you and your colleagues are very nervous about and are actively trying to get them to not to pass? Well, it's early on, but I will tell you there is a, there is a bill uh, that we found out is I think it was in the House Judiciary yesterday, but it was pulled. There's a bill out there. Let me just give you a for instance, a bill that would um, uh, could fine a teacher or a librarian or a museum worker up to $25,000 or five years in prison for displaying um, obscene materials. That type of bill... I, I, my question is, how is that helping with student discipline? The the crucial, really um, most important issue right now that our educators are facing, how is that helping that issue? And what is the definition of obscene? Is a half-nude body more obscene than a totally nude body if we're displaying that in our schools and, and in our museums? Is the statute of uh, David by Michelangelo obscene? You know, I, I, I don't understand why we're spending our time on bills like that when we need to be actually looking for ways. And I, I will applaud Senator Grady, uh, the uh, chair of Senate Education Committee. She does have a bill that's coming out um, dealing with student discipline. So. We, I applaud her for trying to do something in that regard. But to answer your question, Bill, those bills like the uh, obscene displays in our schools and our libraries and our museums, I, I just don't understand. And, and are we really displaying obscene material in our schools? I haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, what is your position on Senate Bill 280? We discussed this earlier with, uh, with Senator Rucker. Uh, that's the one that's the teaching of, uh, of what might be viewed as faith and also science. Well, you know, I'm a Christian, and I believe in – I have my own beliefs, but I have beliefs that I've been raised with. My faith is, is strong. I, I just don't know. That's another thing. Why are we – is that a, a, a real cry from our educators to be able to teach uh, what they're calling intelligent design? I, I'm not so concerned about that bill as I am some of the other things that I've seen, like this obscene materials bill. Uh, I just – I wonder what path that's leading us down and is – creationism science or is it theology I, I i don't know but that bill i don't know that teachers are really fearful of discussing if a student asked them a question if a student would ask me a question mr albert do you believe in you know that we were created or do you believe in evolution uh i don't know that i would really be too fearful to answer that question about my own beliefs if a student really wanted to know my beliefs, but I'm not going to try to push my belief on someone else. Yeah, the way so that I don't. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Fred. Sorry. I was just going to say I don't know that I have uh, a real objection to that bill. I think it's it 
it's not a new bill. It was presented last year and didn't make it to the finish line. So um, I just don't know. what What's the real intent behind that? Uh, Senator Grady argues that she's trying to open it up and make it easier for the teachers to address a uh, issue such as this. If a student asks uh, mm -hmm. the difference between faith and science and the t that the teacher can explore with the students without the fear of being uh, uh, some penalties. You know, you know I, here's my feeling. We need to let teachers do their jobs. And if you have a student who's inquiring about something, I think you need to be honest with them and be able to answer their questions without imposing on them or without trying to, uh, you know, what would we say, um, uh, trying to push your beliefs on someone else is what I'm, I'm trying to say. But I've, I'm not sure that teachers are really fearful of doing that. Um, I'm, a, I'm sure there are probably some instances where, you know, the child goes home and says, oh, Mr. Albert was doing this. He was saying this about his faith, and, and he was trying to get me to be to believe like he believes. I guess that could happen, and things like that do happen. But to answer a child honestly when they are asking you a question and they want, uh, they're really looking for an honest answer, I'm not sure that we have an issue with that right now. Fred, just to flip this issue around a little bit, as a kid I went to Catholic grade school, and when the yes. subject of the creation of the earth came up, the teacher explained creationism, which of course we all had been you know, raised on as Catholics anyway, and then went, yes. in, went into evolution as well as mm -hmm. a scientific theory and explained the differences. Scientists right. seek to explain things from a, t a scientific standpoint. Faith asks you to believe something from a different standpoint. It was right. presented in two different ways, and I thought uh, that there was no, from my perspective, there was no harm in showing both theories of how something can be thought of, and I, it didn't ruin my childhood. <laughs> no. You know, I, I do think it can be done uh, in a non-indoctrinary way. Mm-hmm. But, well, but I understand the stresses that are provided on teachers when they're not sure of what the law is. Well, and, and here's the other thing. How, how are these bills attracting young people into our profession? Or are we scaring them off? Are we, are we saying, you better be careful because if you say this or you say that, you're going to be sued, you're going to be fined, you're going to be put in prison? How, how would that attract anyone to our profession? I say let's let the teachers have the liberty and the freedom to do what they have been trained to do, and that, that is to educate our young people, our students. And we talk about freedom all the time. We, we, we need to have the freedom to be able to have our children become critical thinkers and to think for themselves, present them information. Yes. And not all information is going to be – appealing to everyone but it's it's history it's facts if we're teaching facts then what's the harm in that and then but teaching children how to become critical thinkers is most important and well, to think for themselves and, and that's the biggest complaint adults have of children now is they're not being taught to be critical thinkers so right when i think of the best teachers i had as a kid they taught what was in the book but they taught it in their own creative style mm -hmm. and way and from my perspective, I thought that was the greatest way to learn. It wasn't the exact same thing preparing me for a standardized test in every single exactly. classroom, which if you want to ruin education for everybody, bore them, and that'll do it. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead Matt Miller. Well, Fred, you uh, had a perfect segue there asking, are, are these things going to attract you know, young people into the field of teaching? Uh, how are things going here this year in the state of West Virginia in the 23-24 school year as far as teachers, uh, um, getting new teachers in, uh, filling positions where we maybe haven't had teachers. Uh, just give us kind of an overview of, of what this academic year has looked like for most teachers. Sure, I'll be glad to do that. Well, you know, last year, I think when I spoke with you all, we had about 1,544 shortages uh, of educators, of teachers. Now, that doesn't mean that we have 1,544 empty classrooms. We have teachers 
in those classrooms, long, many times long-term subs or teachers teaching outside of their uh, field of you know, expertise or what they're certified in. This year, that has grown to seven, over 1,700. So we can see that we're not trending in the right direction. We're, we're getting worse. And I think we need to stop and say, why is this happening? And, and you know, this is a decades-old problem. We knew years ago that our teachers were aging and would be retiring, would be leaving, and we need to do something to encourage young people into this profession. That's only grown worse. Um, it, it's here we need to look at why that's happening, but to answer your question, it's it's not very good because our students deserve better. They deserve to have a certified teacher in their classroom teaching them the subject matter. And and I want to say something else about the creativity. Teachers are some of the most creative people that we have. They love that part of being creative and being able to present lessons in a creative way that keeps children engaged, our students engaged. But when you're telling them they can't say this and they can't do that and they can't present this book or that book, that stifles that uh, creative aspect of teaching. So that's harmful. But we're not attracting for whatever reason, and I know some of it is pay, the lack of uh, you know the pay that we need for our educators. Some of that is not doing what we need it to do, and that's attract more people to our profession. Uh, Fred, let me ask kind of a philosophical question. Uh, sure. you, you've mentioned, we've mentioned frequently, the change of the students and how they learn and how they respond. Are we approaching the point that we need to change the paradigm of education? Well... You know, in, in what terms? I mean, I think our educators are staying abreast of things like AI and, and you know, the technology that we all have, uh, are, we're all surrounded with. When I checked in here today, uh, instead of signing my name on a piece of paper, I had a QR code that I had to go on my device, my phone, and bring up and, and register here this morning. So. You know, I, th I think we are in an age where techno we're technology-driven, but we have to be able to use that as a tool. So I, I think our educators do a, a decent job of staying abreast of, of newer ways, of different ways. If you would go into a classroom today, a math class, let's say, because that's my favorite subject, um, I think you would find that the way the lessons are being presented are far different than they were when we were in school learning math. Um, so I think we're I think we're doing a pretty decent job of that. But what we need are more educators willing to to do the job. Is is technology utilization of technology able to address this shortage of teachers in so in a meaningful way admittedly you're going to be losing the, some of the face-to-face -face, but are there ways to compensate for it well i don't think that we're i think we learned a lesson during COVID that we're we're not really going to replace that face-to-face uh, -face mm -hmm. educator in the classroom because there's something else besides just teaching a lesson or or giving out information it's called relationships and building relationships. And as we all look back over our lives, I think we find that we are who we are today because number one, many times our parents, our families, but our educators played such an important role in helping us develop who we are. So I don't think, you know, yeah, uh, AI and uh, chat, whatever that's called, <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, technology is playing a, a vital role, and it's not going to go away, but it's not going to replace that human aspect of what we have in our schools. Is there enough being done that can attract 
um, older teachers, if you will. In other words, I, I'm thinking someone that, that graduates college that jumps into that field of study at, say, 25 years of age, they put 30 years in, they're 55, and may look at, hey, I'm going to retire now at this point, but I still need some compensation in my life to go along with my retirement. They have an expertise in a field. Is there things being done that can help that person move into that teaching field? where they can take that expertise and, and teach it to our young people? Well, I think that's, that's a very good question. And I think some local, some counties are doing a better job of that than others. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what all is being done, but I, I would welcome uh, those educators. But, you know, you get here again, when we have an issue of this student discipline, um, an older teacher as well as our younger teachers, but an older teacher may not want to be sub subjected to getting hurt or being disrespected. And it is, it is very concerning, but I don't know. I know that there have been some bills to uh, look at, uh, you know, taking off limitations on how long a, a sub could sub or an older person who has retired uh, could sub without harming their, uh, Social Security or their retirement benefits. So if if that would be attractive uh, to to take those limits off, then that definitely should be done. Final question for Fred Albert. Now I okay. think I think uh, Fred. Uh, taking a view from twenty thousand feet, we're at a, uh, a very important stage in our evolution education evolution uh, because i i'm not sure that we can continue the paradigm as i grew up with of course it's different right. today uh, but even though i think there's got to be a shift somewhere to accommodate the many many problems which is which were faced in with a teachers and education community fred good to talk with you again i always appreciate your time sir well i appreciate you all it's always uh, my pleasure to speak with you, and I hope you're staying warm. And uh, I'm going to get back inside to the meeting that I'm supposed to be attending. But <laughs> thank you for the opportunity, and thank you for the question. You're a true gentleman. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Frank. Thanks. You're welcome. Take care.